Well, it looks like everybody settled in. Before we call up our first presenters and get started with that, uh, just wanted to go over a few things for this morning. One, I know that you see the agenda in front of you. We got a pretty packed day. I'm really excited about this morning, especially with the uh, DOE and, or sorry, <laughs> I meant uh, EPA and DHEC giving their agency updates for the year, uh, letting you know what their roles are on the site, how they participate, and then SRNL's uh, new director. You haven't had a chance to meet him yet, so I hope you have lots of good questions for him today. Uh, cover our meeting rules real quick. I'm going to ask you all to hold all questions and comments until the end of the presentation. It helps us keep on track on our agenda time. Please silence your cell phones and pagers. I'm going to ask that you not dominate the discussion. Uh, very often, I know a lot of people have a lot of questions. If we can hold it to maybe two questions at a time and then we'll come back around. That seems to work very well if we can do that. Uh, please listen to and respect other people's points of view and make your questions and comments at a microphone, please. Please make sure that you speak clearly into it. If you haven't signed in, please do so. That's how we know that you're here. Please write legibly also. We will record your name in the minutes exactly as you write it. So if it's a blur, the minutes will be a blur too. <laughs> uh, any questions about the agenda, meeting rules, or anything that we have, how we're going to operate today? Gil, I know that you weren't able to be here yesterday, but you had a few comments that you wanted to make. Um, is, do you want me to do chair update at this time? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Columbia. Um, thank you, Doug. Uh, I heard you held it down great yesterday. There's no surprise there, but uh, I do appreciate you filling in. Um, I apologize. I had something that took me away yesterday afternoon, and I apologize in advance. I may be taken away uh, this afternoon as well, but I'll be able to stay here till about 3.30, 4 o'clock. So if I get taken away, I do apologize. Um, <clears throat> as I know Doug went over things yesterday, uh, talking about uh, the opportunity we had to go to Washington, D.C. and um, meet with the Environmental Management Advisory Board and the Environmental Management Site-Specific Advisory Board. Uh, it was a very good meeting. Um, it was wonderful to meet with that other board. It's something we have not done in the past. I definitely thank Shelley um, for being there from South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. Um, she represented not only South Carolina well or the Savannah River site, she cleaned up some of my mess, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Shelley. Um, while we were there, uh, we were, we, the meeting convened on a Tuesday. The Monday night, uh, the previously, the joint uh, House of Representatives and um, Senate uh, met and confirmed uh, their what they call an omnibus uh, package. Uh, and so that's the bill that was sent forward to part of that budget was sent forward to be set for the 2019 um, fiscal year budget. Good news. Environmental management, DOE requested six hundred six billion six point five billion rough number, six point five billion dollars. Well, Congress, in their infinite wisdom, deemed that that wasn't enough, so they gave seven point two. So we're very excited to see the administration focusing on environmental management. Unfortunately, Savannah River didn't receive part of that seven hundred million dollars. Um, so out of all the EM sites around the country, every site received their budget request or were plussed up, um, in some cases significantly, except Savannah Riverside. Savannah Riverside received approximately an 8% reduction in the budget request. I was very excited uh, that that wasn't exciting, that was very disappointing, but the good news was, listening to the leaders um, of Department of Energy, Specifically, the Undersecretary for Environmental Management, Ann White, spoke glowingly of San Vanna River, you know, talking about our successes, talking about SWPF and the schedule and the budget, talking about the SDU, the schedule and the budget, talking about the continued success of vitrification, um, really highlighting the successes of Savannah River site. Um, they were I want to be very careful because this is my interpretation. The Department of Energy headquarters that was represented 
appeared to be frustrated that we didn't get our we didn't get our request. They agree. You know, when we brought up issues, we you know that we'd have the pension coming up, which we've talked about. Well, thank you, um, of coming forward. We have salt salt waste processing facility coming up online, hopefully fairly soon. We have the SDUs that are going to be filled up in 18 months. We are going to have increased vitrification. We have some very good things. We have a rotting infrastructure. So we are in, we are in a need for budgetary funding. So that was the that was what came out of the meeting. But I can sit here and we can hammer away at the, the negatives. The good news is that the climate for environmental management cleanup across the across the EM complex across the country is moving in a positive direction. So we will continue to educate. We will continue to talk to the members of our community as a cab and share with them what we know, what we learned from here. I'm looking forward, James, to you know the same things. I'm looking forward to hearing about from DHEC. I'm looking forward to hearing from EPA. And I ask you, and I mean, as members of the cab, share your knowledge. Share your knowledge with your, with your friends, your family, the people you're out in the community with. One of the big things, and I know there's that little thing at, out there at the site that we're not allowed to talk about under the NNSA, the National Nuclear Security Advisory. Advisory. Um, but we, um, we, don't, we don't handle that. You know, that's, we, don't, we deal with EM. We deal with environmental management. The more I've spoken with people in the last 18 months, people that I assume know what's going on at the site, I assume that, they don't know the difference. They don't know. They think EM and NNSA, they don't see a separation there. Everything that happens is at the site. We have the opportunity to educate people. We have the opportunity to educate them. We understand sitting around this table. We know. So when we talk to our friends, our family, our colleagues, and when we have a conversation about SRS, explain there's a difference between MOX and environmental management. I can't tell you about MOX because I really don't know about it. I don't know, I mean, I know what I've read in the paper. But I can tell you about environmental management, and that's something different. And I think that's something we all agree upon. We all agree that we want to see Savannah River site cleaned up, and we also want to see you know, the, the materials moved off site in a responsible way. Let's have that conversation. Let's not get bogged down in talking about things that we can't talk about as, a cab, as cab members. We can talk about them offline, but we have a unique opportunity to hear all this information, to learn all this information. Don't keep it to yourself. Share it. I ask you, just share it. But I thank you for your time this morning, and I definitely look forward to the presentations today. Thanks, James. Thanks, Gil. So up first, we have John Richards with EPA. Let's get that started. John Richards, um, <clears throat> EPA Region 4. I've had the privilege of 30 years, actually, in EPA Region 4. And guess how many years I worked on Savannah River projects? 30 years. <laughs> uh, most of you may know I'm a, well, I'm now a radiation re regional radiation expert, Region 4. And so most of those years I've been technical support to all of our project managers or own scene coordinators, whoever it is, working on radiation sites, which in Region 4, and I'll get to that a little bit is mostly uh, the large radiation sites, Department of Energy sites, Savannah River, Oak Ridge, Paducah. So that's what I've spent most of my career working on. And since 2010, I moved over to take on roles as project manager. So twice the duty, same pay, but I've actually enjoyed it immensely. And thanks to mentors like Rob and others of other facilities, uh, it's been a great help. So I work, I work on projects at Paducah, Oak Ridge, and Savannah River. And as many of you know, I'm, I'm the acting FFA right now, or this fiscal year. This Rob is supposed to be finishing his detail in our Region 7 office in Kansas City. So he'll be hopefully taking back over acting FFA role. It, it does involve a lot more work than he had informed me about. But as, as we'll talk about, you know, well, there's a lot of good positives about Savannah River that we don't always have with some of our other DV sites. And I think that goes to a lot of what we talk about in our core team approach and our cooperation together. I did notice, you know, Shelly and I are sharing time, but notice in your packet, my slides are at least twice as thick as hers, so 
I should have at least a little bit more time, but cut me off when I, <laughs> when I get to talking too long. And I want to thank the cab uh, in May in Savannah. I hosted, as many of you had a chance to talk to, and I really thank you for that, a Japanese professor working on Fukushima's public meetings. And he had contacted my headquarters uh, person to try to find a public meeting in the U.S. He wanted to come over, and he's trying to come over again for maybe a private site, you know, a little bit less uh, organized and maybe... Uh, see how they do things too, uh, because they've had a lot of, and you can imagine the public meetings around Fukushima, and he's a professor, and I think people like him have been trying to do their best to help in some of these public meetings, as you can imagine the questions you get when you got real live contamination all over your property, and so it was a privilege to host him, he's actually, we're, we're good friends now, he contacts me, so whenever I'm in Tokyo, I'm allowed to stay at his apartment, so I've just got to find my way over there. All right, so some of you may have seen some of this talk before, or part of it. Uh, Rob and I put this together. He's done this talk, um, I forgot how long ago. But so we're going to cover some of the basics of EPA and Superfund, which may be, for many of you, maybe most of you, you know it very well. Some of you may not, or may not remember how we got started, or how we got to here, or how we got to here with Savannah River. So I'm going to go through some of that. If I talk too fast, just hold up your hand. I'll slow down. But I just want to rec uh, uh, respect your time. So yeah, I'll be going through the Superfund, how it applies to SRS versus like our private Superfund sites, <clears throat> and then our <clears throat> direct involvement with the SRS remediation program. <clears throat> so going way back to Nixon's time frame, maybe one of the few good things Nixon did, maybe a lot of good things, but anyway, 1970s when we started. And again, there's a lot of things you'll see in upcoming slides, sometimes it's reaction to what was needed, and that's how we reformed with some uh, bad sites at the time. But it's actually Congress that writes environmental laws. So whether it's the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, CERCLA, those come from Congress, and then we write regulations to implement, implement those laws, and we enforce those regulations, and we set national standards. Now, again, I'm in the radiation, so I tend to lean toward radiation examples, but we provide federal guidance on radiation, so occupational, general public, and as many of you know, especially those that work with the high-level waste and transuranics, the way Congress set it up, we actually provide the standards for the WIP site, uh, hopefully Yucca Mountain in the future, and DOE's obviously the one that operates and builds it, NRC is the one that licenses it. So that's, they kind of set it up for three of us to hopefully work together on those, and we think we have it for the most part. And those familiar with EPA, the way we're set up is like a lot of federal agencies, obviously not like DOE or like NRC, but most federal agencies have 10 regions. So in our regional office in Atlanta, we have labor and other offices, FEMA, or FEMA that's not in our building anymore, but they're nearby in Atlanta. They kind of set up the same way we are with the four regions. Again, our region four, and again, uh, from the radiation perspective, it's also good to know that all eight of our states are agreement states. If you're familiar with that term, that's where NRC delegates all of its regulations and actually usually verbatim to the state radiation office, and what that means Maybe for you, is that states like South Carolina have a much bigger radiation staff than they normally would have if they weren't agreement states. So I think about maybe 35 out of 50 now. Uh, it's kind of grown actually the last 10 years are agreement states. And that means anything like if you find a uranium rock in your garage or a smelter just melted a source, obviously from big to small, they would normally call somebody like me to go out and inspect those type things. Well. Our states were able to handle that because they have the radiation staff because of the agreement state status. And again, the difference is our Region 5 office, Chicago, for years they only had one state like that. So my counterpart there was practically an own scene coordinator, I mean, constantly having to respond like, like our own scene coordinators respond to hurricanes or respond to little, little or big radiation matters. Again, CERCLA, if you may not know, became law in 1980, so it hasn't been around forever been around for most of EPA's life. Uh, the key to a lot of us is when it was amended in 1986, that's when things like ARAR, as you've heard that, may have heard that term, uh, applicable or relevant appropriate requirements, a lot of that got added on to really show how we're actually supposed to actually do Superfund. So, and like actually a lot of the actual guidance documents came out in the late 80s, early 90s, that some of those have been revised, but essentially that's how we still try to operate. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned before, it kind of reacted a lot to stuff, especially some of these famous sites in the, in the past. And actually, the Valley of Drums in near Louisville, Kentucky, one of my fellow project managers, when we thought that 
eyesore had finally identified everything. She was in charge, I think, of finishing one of the projects and then touring it with her contractor, found 6,000 more drums that they had not discovered. So even some of these sites that were around in the early 70s that caused EPA to maybe become EPA still have some issues. So again, and this is where it relates to federal facilities. So again, provides authority for the federal government to respond to releases of threat and releases of hazardous substances. Now hazardous substances for most means chemicals, but there was a key act, Clean Air Act, that also identified ray nuclides of hazardous, sub hazardous substances. Now again, ray nuclides are all carcinogens, just like arsenic and chemicals, but that Clean Air Act was the first one in the EPA world to put it in the same category as hazardous substances. And then CERCLA adopted that, and that's why we've had actually that come up at some of our DOE sites before. Why is nuclides covered, and why is it not just under Atomic Energy Act? Well, it goes back to the Clean Air Act and then CERCLA adopting that. Yeah, and then we have what's called the NCP, the National Contingency Plan. That's where we implement the rules. Uh, again, has all our procedures for conducting CERCLA response actions. And again, establish the risk level. So you know, most of you know our risk level that we can look at for a site is 10 to minus six to 10 to minus four. The difference is we don't usually take action, and this may be more maybe for a private site instead of a large federal facility, but it can apply there too, especially in our decisions, that we don't usually take action on an individual operable unit or site unless we see something's gonna go over 10 minus fourth risk to a resident, uh, commercial, or a recreational scenario. Now that could be different for a state uh, so I think South Carolina may have a trigger, or maybe uh, they can correct me, 10 to minus 5 or 10 to minus 6 to take some kind of action. It could just be institutional controls, but that's not what EPA has. But again, when you have a tri-party agreement, we look to the state if they want to do something more than what we would do. So obviously other states, I think we have similar with Tennessee, Kentucky, that again may have a lower threshold for at least doing some kind of action. Yeah, so here's where we get to uh, federal facilities. So executive order that was written 12580, 1987. That's where it delegated all to DOE and DOD, all the armed forces and all the bases, because uh, that was just starting all the base closures in the late 80s, early 90s. That makes the federal agency, DOE, DOD, the lead agency. So again, they still federal fe facilities must follow all the policies, procedures, again, spelled out national contingency plan and again, EPA will either concur, like for example, in, in an action memo, we actually concur. We don't actually uh, sign it like we would a record decision. Just a little difference there. Or again, or if we decide, because we're the final signatures on the ride, even for, especially for a private site, especially for a federal agency, if there's a lot of disagreement, sometimes we may recommend something different, but it's very unusual unless we go to dispute where we would say, no, we're gonna go with our remedy over yours, but we are the final signatures of that for a federal facility. Yeah, so again, we're subject to this, the same circular requirement similar to private entities. And we've kind of had a one super fun motto for maybe the last 10 years, and some of you may have met, at, I don't know, Franklin Hill, our Superfund division director, has been to any of these cab meetings, have been to some at Paducah and Oak Ridge. But he's emphasized that a lot in his 10 to 12 years that we're one super fun. So unfortunately, that means for radiation people like me, that now we're, we, <laughs> we have actually reorganized about five years ago where we moved our federal facility branch. We used to have a federal facility branch and Superfund in our region and two private uh, branches. And we're kind of now in the two Superfund branches, a mixture of federal facilities, DOD, DOE, project managers. And many of us have had to take on private sites as we've had people retire. We can't hire anybody to replace them. So I even have a private site and Northeast uh, North Carolina, that used to be an old Navy site, they turned into a wood uh, thing, and it doesn't have a lot of contamination, but there's no radiation, so it's very boring to me, but anyway. So that just shows you that it doesn't matter who you are, you could be acting FFA for Savannah River, we're gonna give you a private site as well, just to make your life more fun, so. But we do try to implement all these the same. And again, our, our managers, like Frank and Hill, have learned through the process that a typical private site might be one or two operable units, oh, Savannah River has five or six project managers working on it, and you have 99 operable units. So we kind of broke the system that Circle usually try to track all these things. But, yeah. yeah, this just shows you all the different sites around our region. Well, if you can see the squares, triangles from where you're sitting, but it just shows you how widespread some of them are. 
Yeah, and for most you know the, the DOE sites, the Pinellas that closed over 10 years ago, that was where they used to do the tritium triggers uh, down in Pinellas, Florida. That was really under a RICRA, under the state leave. But again, we had a lot of work with that, with it, its closure. But again, uh, it does involve most of our work with the DOE sites and most of our federal facilities. Yeah, and over 34 NPL or BRAC facilities could be done under RICRA or NPL. And again, most of that BRAC work was in the 90s, and we had residuals of that or probably for most of the last, uh, up until about 10 years ago. So we still have a lot of DOE, DOE sites that are CERCLA we still work on, like Camp Lejeune that's in the middle of the hurricane, got very flooded. That's one of our big cleanup sites. But a lot of those, a lot of those have been closed or Maybe the state records maybe take them over by now. But again, what used to be probably the major work of our Region 4, for example, Federal Facility Branch, is now more DOE than DOD. But we still have at least, so in other words, uh, we have probably 10 or 11 project managers working on DOD sites. They probably also have a private site as well. Again, so Savannah River, like a lot of DOE sites, was added to the National Party List in 1989. Uh, in fact, I don't, I know there's a few DOE sites that were not added. I know like Portsmouth, unlike Paducah, was not added. It stayed under a record program. And again, how some of those happened and didn't happen, I'm not sure. But again, we, it was required to have a federal facilities agreement. And actually, I was, at that time, I was in the AIR program, <clears throat> and we had a Clean Air Act, uh, NESHAP final, a Federal Facility Compliance Act agreement with Savannah River, like we had with other DOE sites. So they could come in compliance with all the, the new regulations of the NESHAP for their air emissions. Yeah, and as I mentioned before, these are our main acts that we work under. Uh, again, CERCLA, RICRA. Again, most of the states have been delegated in our region. RICRA, I think maybe only Mississippi doesn't have the delegation that we do a lot more work with them directly. But again, all of these, and again, under CERCLA, we're implementing uh, a remedy, a record of a decision. Some of these may involve, but we don't actually do these permits once it's a CERCLA site. You may do everything exactly the same like, for example, the Clean Air Act NESHAPs, if we have some kind of air emissions under one of our rods, but you wouldn't have a, a separate permit under CERCLA. So again, three tri-party agreement, and this is, again, true with all of our uh, private sites as well, but even more important with our federal facilities and the large amount of work and amount of work we have with you, at Savannah River and Oak Ridge and Paducah. So you see some of the things that we try to work through, schedules and deadlines, it's obviously huge for us, knowing how to plan when we are come to these meetings and there's one or two Department of Energy people and you know five to ten contractors, even the state usually brings a lot more people to the table than we have in our project managers. We're Savannah River, we've had up to five or six project managers before, and right now we have four. You'll see those in a minute, or five. So it's very important for us to plan out how much work we have, how, how schedules, milestones, enforceable milestones. And again, even if we have to get to dispute resolution, we talked about that with the tanks, I'll have some of that at the end. But we've been very happy and blessed with Savannah River that a lot of things we were able to work through without trying to go to maybe pass an informal dispute, which just stays maybe in the core team or with the FFA managers. Yeah, so our role, again, we have oversight of all the remedial actions at Savannah River. Again, we have a contractor that helps us, so sometimes they do some oversight at the site that helps us where we can't get there all the time to actually observe a lot of the actual actions going on. Uh, and again, our job is to make sure NCP, CERCLA, FFA itself, guidance. Again, FFA is kind of the, the key thing for us that now we have that, that we follow that. Again, technical procedural assistance, even uh, training we do from time to time. And again, so this, the state and EPA, again, when concurrence is required, whether it's the selection remedies, I mentioned the record decision, or it could be an informed by action memo where it's just concurrence, where you implement the remedies, again, operate them, determine the success of the remedies. And that's something, again, we'll talk, uh, having a few slides later about the five-year review period. So even when we've decided what we're going to do every five years, or in case of Savannah River, so it's so huge, we have so many sites, we actually do parts of the five-year review almost every year. We realize that it's easier to do, break it up into four or five different uh, categories for our five-year reviews. But in the, in the regular Superfund world, you, every five years you assess how remedy is doing, see if anything needs to be changed or, or how things are going. 
Yeah, so involvement early and often. And I think that's one thing in our, I mentioned again some more here, but our core team getting scoping meetings done early. Again, I think what happened in the 90s when maybe we didn't agree with a lot more than we do now, and that was happening of other DOE sites too, maybe it was just common that you would do like a re remedial investigation and you would give it to the regulators to review and have a lot of issues when instead of getting together to decide maybe how we want to go with things before, that makes that remedial investigation or feasibility study a lot smoother if you talk beforehand instead of just throwing, we call it throwing something over the wall, review it, have 30 to 80 pages of comments. Well, now we don't have that much because we talk about it be beforehand with a scoping meeting. So and we usually have a facilitator with that in case we have any disagreements to work through. Yeah, so here's our team. Uh, again, I'm right now the acting FFA, and again, Rob has been probably working on it the longest of all of us since I think 03, uh, at least as project manager. Again, I've worked on a lot of times as more radiation support. I think you met Jennifer Tuff. She may have been to the cab a couple of times. Deidre, I know, has been here quite a lot. And then Kyle, I think most of you met our community involvement. Who I thought was supposed to give a talk here this time, but maybe it's next time. And then we have our support that's in the region. Now, this is very common. You have a project manager. I happen to be a radiation expert, or uh, like Jennifer is a hydro. Well, we often may be able to do that ourselves, but there's obviously a lot of other things that we rely on our team back in our office. And again, with their being pulled, as you can imagine, we have so many 200 private sites. They might be in size-wise as big of our three DOE sites, but again, it's the amount of time you're spending on this site and this site and that site. So a lot of our experts, Tim Frederick's one of three or four of our risk assessors, uh, Ben's one of three or four of our hydros, well, they often look at stuff after our contractor has already reviewed it. And that helps break up the time because they realize they cannot maybe review a whole FS or whole document that they, would not, they might want to do to, unless there's some issues, they might get more involved. And again, our attorney, I don't know if you've met her, Rylan Finch, Again, review, especially any uh, land use control, that's one of the things that they get involved in and obviously get to any proposed plan or rod. Our attorneys are one of our key team members. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, Tech Law, our contractor, we've been very lucky to have them for a long time. And again, we're having a whole new contract uh, rework and how we're doing things. So we're hoping to continue with them, but there's no guarantee. And actually, Rob has been part of that, of our, how our new contracts are supposed to go. So it's kind of, broken up how we've been normally doing uh, contracts in the past, but we'll see how that goes with our contractors that we've been working with. Okay. <clears throat> Again, th and this is our, our involvement in the remedial process, so this goes through all the things we get involved with. So again, with time, I won't go through that. You can see that slide. And again, what we do as a project manager, again, we're representing from the core team that we've met with, the DOE representative, the state representative, to our management on how we're trying to go with a decision. So that's what gets us through maybe a lot of headaches that maybe other sites may still go through. But trying to reach consensus together as a core team before we move ahead for any kind of project or, or uh, especially to our record decision. So again, uh, it's a proposed plan is issued by the, issued to the public by DOE, again approved by us and the, and the state. And then DOE writes the record decision Again, considering any of those public comments, again, the core team has provided their input already. That's where DOE signs the rod, then EPA, then South Carolina. Again, this is just showing, again, what we do. And I mentioned about the five-year remedy reviews. And again, where we do things almost every year, but again, kind of on a five-year rotation of each of those type of five-year reviews. So again, we kind of talk about the decision documents belong to DOE, South Carolina, and EPA. We're all kind of in this together as a tri-party, uh, EPA must sign a rod for it to be a final per the requirements of MCP. So that's where we often say, well, we have the final hook. Well, we don't often use that as, or hammer, whatever you want to call that. But anyway, that's how it's set up in NCP. And again, as we talked about before, and this is the key for Savannah Rivers, where maybe in the 90s we didn't cooperate as much as possible, but things like this and with a facilitator, getting more organized, again, getting things up front has helped us get through maybe a lot, of, and again, we're not going to agree on everything today. We may have a totally different approach on a groundwater remedy than DOE, and the state may even have a different one there, but that's where we try to get together, maybe make compromises that we, we only don't get everything the way we would want it, 
or maybe the state, but we hopefully and usually work together to get at least a, a, a commitment to work together to maybe do a, a remedy that we can all at least sign. So these are all the areas we're working currently on Savannah River, and again, you know, familiar with most of these areas. We mentioned yesterday just the B and D, that's kind of one of the more active things that SRS mentioned. And then I'll finish quickly here with the tanks. I won't cover too much of this, and Shelly may talk about this herself, because again, this is the role where the state has more of a lead than us. And the circle of this is where we don't have the same thing at other Dewey sites, because again, you have to have hollow waste tanks like Hanford or Idaho or Oak Ridge, or I'm sorry, Savannah River to have this under CERCLA. So this just goes through our where we are with the eight tanks have already been closed. Again, we have milestones that exist for the remaining tanks. And again, those may be in jeopardy because of the saltwater processing facility and some of those delays. And again, that's we've worked through some of those issues and we've talked about that before. Yeah, so again, the individual tank closures are per the South Carolina wastewater program but the tank farms are circle OUs, and they will have rods. But again, we only have two tank farms, F and H. I think Rob and others realized a while back that we need to have some more milestones that are help us, help you, as in DUE, work through some of these. So we divided a lot of these up into different ways to look at it instead of just waiting for, okay, 50 years from now, we'll get a rod for H, H tank farm. We realize we need to get involved along the way. We obviously know the state's already involved. So again, that's, and also that gives us the thing at the bottom, the tank closure milestones in the FFA, the subject to dispute if missed. So I won't go through some of this with the time, I mentioned some of this. So we have the general closure plan. Again, that's under the state's wastewater permit. Again, it's the, the South Carolina is the lead for the tanks up into the proposed plan and rod. Again, when the, when the, for F and H. So we re actually, we review and issue comments to South Carolina on a lot of the tank documents leading up to that. So a lot of times they're taking lead and we'll actually provide comments to them to provide back to DOE on some of those issue. So again, after a tank exits the permit, the oversight is done by South Carolina and EPA per the FFA. And again, many of you know NRC's role in the high level waste, we actually have a monthly phone call with them to go over a lot of our just regular activities that we work with. Again, as I have this two more slides. So this uh, a proposed plan, interim rod have been done for each tank farm. Again, each individual tank will be added to the interim rod via this ESD um, as the tanks close and exit the South Carolina wastewater permit. So that's happened obviously eight times so far. Again, and, and this is one of our concerns. We were, they obviously we've had many discussions about this. So again, we have to make it aware to our management here, even headquarters when things like this happen that would they want to make sure they're aware of everything and why the delays are happening. So, uh, and we've talked about this before, you're very aware of the ticker system, but it was very helpful, as I mentioned yesterday, to walk down and actually see the, the ticker itself, uh, technology developed by American companies, I think, for Fukushima work, that we're hoping to be successful here to speed up our work here with the tanks. So very hopeful about that. And again, EPA is committed along with DUE in South Carolina to close these tanks and get them done Good and, and well. All right, so that's all I have. Go ahead. Thanks, John. Let's go ahead and get the EPA specific questions out of the way now, and then afterwards, if we have any joint questions, we can do all those. So, Don? John Gillis, CAB. Um, relative to all the, the major laws, all the, the RECRA CERCLA, all the, the clean air, clean water, all that, have there been any? Uh, reductions in regulations implementing these laws in this administration, especially those that would affect the site? Not to my knowledge. Again, I'm not directly involved, obviously, with all of those. That's, you know, like the Clean Air Act is done in the Air Division, and at least uh, from, from my knowledge, no one is, at least in my region, is doing less on our facilities than before the current administration took over. Obviously, there's always a more a bigger issue that we're not it's not easy to replace people that are retiring. Mm -hmm. So I remember uh, the Phoenix Waste Management Conference, DUE gave this big talk of their workforce being 60% over the age of 50, that's just like EPA. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of people retiring. I was one time. of those that retired from DUE a few years ago. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> so getting people replaced like people like me, I, I don't know how long I'll be here. Mm -hmm. I'm still enjoying it, so I'll, I'll stay. But, but that's a, actually the bigger issue than, but we've never been in terms of actually implementing what we're supposed to do uh, to date. So. Thank you. Right. Joyce. 
making notes. There we go. All right, so Joyce Underwood Cab, um, I have two questions regarding slides 28 and 29. Okay, um, so that's what all you've got going on. What would you say on that list are your priorities? Well, Is that a thing you can identify? Uh, priorities. Well, D has been a, a big one for us recently just because of all the actions going on <coughs> there and getting things done, and especially actually getting milestones moved up six or seven years because of the tank dispute. It's made even more focused on the D. Uh, we like to say all of our parties if they're on our, our milestones, and we really dedicate with our four or five people to do as much as we can on each one. Now, again, if something's in a scoping process, we've had a lot of uh, big doctors lower three runs, feasibility study, things like that. So that's probably one of our parties right now because of just the sheer amount of work we're having to do with that. Uh, and so again, would you tank, say the that the tanks are still always one of our highest party? That's actually I'm the lead. For that, since Martha Bear retired, that maybe you rem may remember. So that one of the duties I'll be doing mostly once uh, Rob comes back in as the FFA. Would you say that the lower three runs and the tanks are perhaps the most problematic areas on that list? Uh, yeah, probably just because we mentioned before, just because of the delays of Holloway's tanks, driven by technology and other things that they've identified, uh, that I would say that's one of our highest. Okay. Lower and three runs. We haven't uh, fortunately had any big delays in that, and those are on schedule, so we're good. Okay. And then with number 29, um, obviously there are some issues coming up with meeting these benchmarks. How were those benchmarks arrived at? Like, where did the, no what is, I guess, what is the rate of tank closure, and how did you get to 2022? Uh, Dewey maybe answer that better than I, but I think at one point we were just, we had tried to get up, and maybe it was two aggressive schedules that we're looking at now, but trying to do two tanks every two years. And for a while, it looked like we were going to keep that up. Uh, now, maybe that'll keep going after the SWPF is going, but that was the original plan. And again, the bulk waste removal was another way to track how a tank's progress is going that we added in. That sometimes even that may not be the best way to do it, but that was at the time the best way to track those type of milestones. And just like Progress. one more thing, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, it's related. If you don't meet your benchmark, fines are all that's going to happen, or is anything else going to happen? Uh, well, we are very reluctant to do fines. I think we've only done it one time at Oak Ridge. Again, we try to work through, so even when we may miss a milestone, we try to see what we can do to get it going again, or in the case of just trading other projects moving up. That's to us much better, as our Superfund Division Director said, than issuing fines. It takes money out of the pockets. Thank you. Okay. So we got five cards up. We'll see how quickly we can move through these five and then move on to D head. We'll start with Greg. Sorry, I wasn't expecting my turn to come so quickly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Murray Cab, thank you for the presentation. Just real quick on uh, slide nine, and I'm still learning all this stuff, talking about the national contingency plan. You're talking about establishing risk levels, and you talked about 10 to the negative four to 10 to the negative six. Yes. Risk, I quite frankly have no idea what that means. Could you explain that? One in a million risks to one in 10,000 risks. Okay. It's how we set from 1980 that even went back before that, what we determined something might be hazardous to have to do some kind of action. Hazardous to a person or just some sort a of residential general? Residential scenario, industrial scenario, or recreational scenario. If there's no exposure potential, then obviously there's no okay. risk. It'd be but, human contamination. Right. So obviously sort. we've, okay. ag we've agreed it. on like here a lot of industrial risks. So a lot of the scenarios are have defaults for those parameters, mm -hmm. you know, like 25 years, that kind of thing, eight gotcha. hours a day. So. All right. Thank you. That makes sense. Charles. <clears throat> Charles Hilton Cab. On page 29 of your slide presentation, and we thank you for this presentation. <laughs> The remaining tank closures and tank bulk waste removal efforts are all in jeopardy. And then on 31, uh, EPA is concerned that the salt waste processing facility is not operational and that will cause the delay. Yesterday in our presentation on the salt waste on page 17, the SWPF is both 
on schedule for completion and on budget. I'm struggling putting this together. Does that mean the rod doesn't address the current schedules or what's? Uh, Jim may speak to this, but I think the original date was 2011 SWPF. So again, it's now been seven years delayed. It's on schedule now, but again, it was originally supposed to be 2011. That means all of these other things would have gone through much faster. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, just if, if I could, Jim Folk Dewey. Well, what Pam was referring to was her, what they call CD4 milestone with headquarters. So I believe it was January 2021, maybe I'm going off memory, and uh, two point something billion dollars. So Pam was specifically referring to her project management commitments. As, as John pointed out, when we negotiated, and that was before me even, but when we negotiated some of these milestones for 2022, projected startup was around the 2011, 2012 timeframe. So, you know, we, we try to address the progression of time and, and updating and we'll be entering these kind of negotiations here in the next year, same kind of uh, approach where we kind of, realism takes over. So schedules may be delayed for certain things. And, and just as John mentioned, we have, uh, we go into negotiation, address any changes. And then if there's some additional milestones, for instance, that we add in or, or whatever, but it's a, uh, although we, we, we do our best to meet these milestones, it is an interactive process that we recognize there are times that, that things get delayed. And, and kind of Shelley Wilson with DF, but you may Can be I get you to grab a mic, Shelley? Oh, you go on? Okay. You may be remembering that in my remarks yesterday, I pointed out that there's a state schedule for startup of the salt waste processing facility. And that's at the end of this calendar year. Um, 2018. So that is a, in a state uh, document rather than a, an EPA federal document. Correct. But it's for startup of the salt waste processing facility. But in your documents, they would also be approved by EPA, or did I miss something? It's a three way. It, it's um, different milestones are different ways. So some are three way agreements, and some are just the state. Yeah, particularly it's under their permit. Again, I mentioned up until the proposed plan of rod, it's all under their permits for the tanks. Yeah. Susan? Susan Corbett, CAB, thank you for this presentation. Um, there's a tritium production facility on the site that we, it's not under our purview, we're not allowed to talk about it, but it does release tritium into the environment. Is that something that you monitor and report on and is that, are those reports available to the public? Uh, I don't think EPA, EPA has a direct role with that. Again, we can, maybe on Denise Shap, I've even done an inspection there in the past. So up. EPA doesn't monitor in a, in Unless an SA it falls facilities? under one of our operable units, and I think right now it's not because it's an operating facility. I think it's that simple. So that's not something that currently, but it will be in the future, one of our operable units. If it has released anything to the environment, it will be uh, taken care of at that time, I'm guessing. Thank you. And then Narendra. Jim close it out. No, 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 Malik Cab. Uh, I believe that entire SRS is under circular site. Correct. Okay. Whenever it is going to be closed, it will be capped and completed according to the circular closure plan. My next question is how can CAB help you to generate some more information about uh, circular and uh, help EPA? Uh, okay. So uh, first, I forgot the dates because all of our DOE sites go into 2040, 2050, 2060 for final site closure completion. So I forget the one cement rivers. I get them confused with other three DOE sites. Uh, but they actually, so some of the sites like Oak Ridge, they've actually narrowed some of the boundaries. But again, Circular really doesn't have the boundary cement river site. It's wherever the contamination goes. So that's one thing in, in uh, even a private site. So. For helping us, sometimes it's educating the public. Again, I think a lot of this may have been redundant to many of you, but I think a lot of uh, people may understand circular versus maybe what the permits does, but that was asked before, South Carolina. So some of that might be some good fact sheets to cover to show the public the difference of who does what and how maybe we come together for some of these ag agreements with our core team process. See, some of our facilities are permitted under RECRA. So how they circular and record merge together. Yeah, and I think, so again, most, I won't have a full answer, but 
quickly. Most of our sites started under maybe RICRA, and then when Superfund takes over, sometimes they just rolled into our circle program where they still may fulfill a lot of the RICRA functions, but under CERCLA, we may do a, a combination. So what may be a remedial investigation under CERCLA, they've already started under uh, RFI, I forget what the <laughs> other terms are, uh, that we've been under RICRA. So sometimes we have a kind of merging document from the RICRA side that includes CERCLA. But in general, RICRA doesn't cover radionuclides. So especially the big DOE site, there obviously could be a lot of uh, sites that just has chemicals and doesn't even have uranium or other things, but often they're together. So CERCLA helps covers both of those um, hazardous constituents. Okay. Thank you. And Jim. <coughs> Jim Giel, Cap. Um, in your uh, overall budget for Region 4, how much of that budget is devoted to activities taking place at SRS? I don't know if I can answer that monetarily wise, but at least personnel wise, and again, not every person like me is dedicated like Justice of Van River, but probably 90% of my work is Department of Energy support, whether it's radiation support or project manager support. So we, I think there's up to 10 project managers of maybe our 35 to 40 project managers in Region 4. So that gives you an idea, maybe, so maybe one fourth mm -hmm. of our work is federal facilities, and that was much larger just 10 years ago when I came in the federal facilities. So I'm not sure budget wise, but at least uh, um, personnel wise, which is obviously salaries. Yeah. Probably and, the big and cost. The fact driver. that almost every Superfund site, private site, has one project manager. Mm -hmm. And these large DOE sites, we have four to six at any one time. Okay, Easier thank you. Idea. All right, Shelly, you ready to get started? So good morning, Shelly Wilson with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. And I'm so pleased today to have Michael Bailey and Karen Sprayberry with me. They're gonna help me with this presentation. So um, thanks to John, he didn't hog the time. That's what makes EPA such a good partner because they, <laughs> they, um, they, they cooperate very well with us and we're, we're very, um, very pleased to work with them. So um, I'm gonna talk about DHEC oversight of a Savannah River site today. And one thing I just wanna note right up front is that we do not cover the storage of spent nuclear fuel or nuclear materials, and that's because those two things are specifically exempted by Congress uh, so that DOE self-regulates for those materials. But what we do, uh, of course, we're looking at protection for, for the site, emergency preparedness, improvement of areas where there was previous contamination, and also um, oversight, independent environmental monitoring. We're gonna to touch on community engagement today as well. So starting off with, um, with protection. This is um, how we ensure there's no um, degradation of the environment. And so um, you heard John talk about EPA and the federal role. So what happens is um, EPA and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they'll set the laws and the standards uh, so, so all of the laws that govern and standards like drinking water standards or what makes you know, the number that makes something a hazardous waste versus not. So they set that, um, that national framework so it's consistent. And then uh, states like South Carolina, we adopt and copy those laws and those standards. Um, so we have to be at least as stringent as the federal standards we can be more stringent if we choose to do that. And then the state will, um, uh, after we have those standards in place, will work to, um, to develop a program uh, to be able to implement and oversee those standards. And, um, and we have to meet you know, certain quality to do that. And once we've met a certain quality for our implementation programs, EPA will give the authority to us. So they, they pass it down and we do the work of implementation. And so, um, so we have been um, already delegated for the, you know, the, the big, uh, really most programs, certainly the big programs, air, water, waste, and cleanup. 
And, um, and just to let you know that we get inspected too. <laughs> uh, it's usually yearly, EPA will come and say, hey, how are you doing with air and water and hazardous waste? And, um, and they'll look at our records and they'll ask us questions and they'll let us know if we're doing well. And I'll, I'll let you know that normally what we get is very good feedback when EPA comes to review and inspect us. So what does that mean? So we have those national laws and standards. Uh, DHEC will issue permits in accordance with those national laws and standards. And then we have people that go out and check, that do inspections at the site. And if they find anything that's um, not meeting the standards, then, um, then, then we'll look and see if we need to take enforcement action and, um, and, and take that action to um, ensure that com compliance is, um, is, is obtained. So that's basically how, how that works. And um, for all the different um, areas that, that we implement, um, it, it covers just about everything you can think of. Certainly the big ones, um, air, drinking water, wastewater. We also cover stormwater, so that's all the rainwater that falls. Um, looking at you know, even sediment that might move to, um, to, to possibly uh, harm streams, we, we look at, we, we have standards for that so the streams are protected. Um, we have wetlands uh, requirements and so um, e even things that you, um, that you might not think about so much like navigable waters. So lots of different areas that we cover um, through, through laws and um, regulations and, and permits. And, and I'll just say Savannah River has many, 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 many of those permits in those types that you saw on that slide. So uh, another um, key role, and as I mentioned for the, the storm yesterday, we have people at our agency, all they do is emergency preparedness. So they um, look at all the equipment we have, making sure it's, up, you know, it's working and it's up to date. They have plans about how they're gonna respond. Um, and, and like I said, we've been working 24-7 um, most of September <laughs> for the storm response uh, across the state. We also have people that, um, that actually are um, uh, really more dedicated and they focus specifically on SRS for emergency preparedness. So we have people with the top security clearance uh, just in case that ever comes up if there's um, a, an incident. But, but if, there, if something ever happened at Savannah River site, of course the site would take the major response but would call on us um, if, if, uh, if we can help and we're prepared to help. We, we meet with them on a regular basis to talk about what's the latest and to make sure we're, we're uh, up to current standards for preparedness. So, um, so we, we have a, a lot of um, effort um, really behind the scenes to make sure that we're always safe in South Carolina for any, any incidents. So um, another big focus for us is improvement. And um, you heard John mention all of the areas at Savannah River site where there was potential and actual contamination. So uh, really over 500 of those individual areas. And we have, um, uh, our, our hazardous waste permit addresses soil and groundwater cleanup. Our federal facility agreement, um, again, that you heard John mention, also addresses soil and groundwater cleanup. So DHEC primarily, oops, oops, I did the wrong button. DHEC primarily, our authority mostly comes from this, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. EPA's authority, as you heard John say, mostly comes from that Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Whew. And then um, <laughs> through the, the Federal Facility Agreement, we marry those together. And so um, we're concerned about RECRA, John's concerned about CERCLA, but we, we roll all the decision makers together into one decision. So we don't want to get a year later and say, oops, we forgot something RECRA, oops, we forgot something CERCLA. We work together so that when we get to a decision, it, it's, um, it, it, it's meeting all of the applicable requirements. So, um, and at DHEC we'll bring in other areas too if we have to, to make sure when that decision is, is, is up um, for public comment that it's a good, uh, good well-rounded decision. And so all of those, um, uh -oh, somehow. 
uh, all of those decisions um, also will go out for public review and comment. So, um, so one, one big thing that I want to point out here is that um, the Federal Facility Agreement, EPA, DOE, and DHEC, uh, we, we really work hard to do that through partnering. And what that means is we have a core team and that core team, they're very dedicated and focused. They set a schedule, they work real time, and they, um, they're trained in how to reach con uh, decisions that everybody can support. So it's, um, it, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit more um, uh, upscale than your typical cleanup process because again, we train those people on how to work together to get the best decision at the end on schedule uh, with efficiencies and on time. So um, this partnering, this core team that we do is actually something that, as I mentioned, um, the, the, the EMAB, the, that National Advisory Board, we, we made a recommendation that um, Hanford actually adopt that partnering process because we've seen it be so efficient and, and, um, and, and just such a, a wonderful uh, time and money saving process to be able to make cleanup decisions. So, Moving on for, um, you know, the, the, the site, um, it's operated for a long time. So before there were regulations, there were some waste streams that were generated um, really before the standards kicked in. And, um, and, and that was true across the nation. So, um, so Congress in 1992 noticed that, that there was a lot of legacy waste from past operations sitting at sites that had built up. And so they passed um, this Federal Facility Compliance Act in 92 and said, hey, DOE, you've got, to, you've got to get that legacy waste down. And so DOE put together plans for how they were going to have all those streams treated and disposed. And uh, the state reviewed that plan and, and actually approved and um, issued an order. Uh, so, so the bottom line is that um, because of this process, most of the the mixed, and when I say mixed, that's hazardous and radioactive waste. Um, most of those mixed legacy streams at Savannah River site have by now um, been treated and disposed. So the, um, the, certainly for low level, there's a, a little bit of transuranic mixed waste that's left. And um, you've probably heard me say in the past, that it started off with about 12,000 cubic meters down to around 700 cubic meters. Um, most of that was shipped off to the, the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico for disposal there. And so, um, so what we have now is um, uh, you know, around 5% of that original legacy volume that remains at Savannah River site. Most of it gone, 95% gone. And, um, and so that's a, a, a huge success story over the years. Um, high, high level waste is also in that category of mixed waste covered by that site treatment plan. And, um, and we'll get to that um, right here. So um, high level waste, you, you've heard me um, mention that. It's the, it's the biggest concern uh, for Savannah River site for our agency. And, um, and that's 35 million gallons of the mixed radioactive and toxic waste in a liquid form sitting in tanks that are aging and degrading. And so, um, so our concern is that that waste be treated and the tanks be closed. And so we call it the single largest environmental threat in the state of South Carolina, more so than some of our big landfills because the waste in landfills was solidified and treated before it went in. Um, so th this, this waste, again, it's liquid, which makes it mobile. And, um, and it's highly radioactive and, and toxic. So we focus a lot of attention on that. Um, we're, we're, um, because of the fact that we've all worked so hard, um, eight tanks have been closed. So that's, um, that's really, really good news in this story. And I'll give you a little bit more behind that. Um, back in 97, uh, the first two tanks were closed. And then after that, um, really work, um, a, a lot of the closures stopped around the nation. And that was because um, uh, somebody really related to Idaho had sued DOE saying, hey, you can't close these tanks and leave anything in the bottom. 
You're not a national repository. You're not a Yucca Mountain. So you, you, you can't do that. And, um, and it was really just a, a, a legal quagmire. And so, um, so our Senator Graham uh, helped pass um, Section 3116 of the 2005 National Defense Authorization Act. And what that said was, um, yeah, you get out um, all of that waste. You might have a little tiny bit um, remaining in the tanks that you just can't get out. So if DOE says it's, um, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, removed to the maximum extent practical, um, and um, if the state where that waste is uh, says it's okay under a closure plan or permit, um, and the NRC in consultation, they, they say they don't have any, any concerns. If you meet all these three things, you can leave that little tiny um, last little bit of residual left in those tanks. Um, and so what that did is it cleared the legal pathway uh, forward for tank closure. And um, Savannah River, uh, we, we have all worked together to have six more tank closures since that process. So again, this, this legally cleared the way um, uh, for, for future momentum and um, it's still working great for us today. So, um, so, so high level waste and, um, and, and I'll admit this does get a little bit, um, a little bit regulatorily um, complicated because we, we regulate that under our state wastewater program. It's regulated under our hazardous waste permit. It's um, also addressed through our federal facility agreement process. Um, so we throw every authority <laughs> that, we, that we can into that mix of what, um, what is over or, or has requirements for high level waste. And so, um, so that's a lot and that's why it gets complicated with the agreements and whether it's three parties versus one party making decisions on the milestones. But in some areas, we, we have chosen to be more stringent. And again, we throw everything that we can at it in terms of authority, but in terms of process, we make sure all those authorities work together so it doesn't slow anything down. And so, so it's on us. We make sure all of that is integrated into one decision. And when you see that, it's a closure plan. And so um, you'll see different closure plans come up for public comment asking you for your input on a, a, a specific tank for high level waste closure. That's your chance. It's in one document, but you can rest assured that behind that document is every authority that we have, including we've asked EPA to comment on it and the NRC to comment on it as well. Okay, so again, lots of authorities, but we work hard to make sure it's integrated and, um, and, and cooperative um, rolling all those decision makers together at one time. And, and we do have schedules for um, closure of the tanks that are um, uh, old style or not meeting the secondary containment requirements. So um, the, the, um, the, the two of the things that I'll mention is that um, we also have an oversight program and you've heard a lot about um, that from us in the past where we go out independently and take samples of soil and groundwater and sediment and surface water and milk and um, you know, all sorts of things on the site and surrounding the site. And, um, and so, for example, you heard Grace Ann Martin mention that we have our latest data out there on the table for you about that independent um, environmental sampling. So, um, so please take advantage of it. But, um, but we do that as another data point, again, that's, um, that's independent of, of DOE. So um, the, 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 um, what I'd also like to do is just give um, Michael Bailey and Karen Sprayberry an opportunity to talk to you about um, some community engagement and also environmental is uh, justice issues that we, um, that we address. So Michael, are you up first? Good morning, my name is Michael Bailey. Um, I know that we're a little close to time, so I will be extremely short, but I'll be extremely brief as well. Um, so once again, my name is Michael Bailey. I serve as the Environmental Justice Coordinator here at SCDHEC. Now, for those of you who don't know what environmental justice is, uh, EPA actually has a really good definition. 
It's a bit of a run-on sentence, if you will, but it's, uh, it's very accurate. So environmental justice is considered as the fair and meaningful inclusion of people regardless of race, age, ethnicity, income, in regards to the development, implementation, and enforcement of envir environmental regulations, policies, and decisions. So here at SEDHEC, essentially we see that as making sure that people have a seat at the table. So my role as the coordinator is to provide technical assistance to a lot of our bureaus, including our Bureau of Land and Waste Management, where a lot of our remediation services take place. But in regards to the community, it's also providing access to information. Um, I think your chair made a wonderful point as far as just getting the information out there. The information that we share is anything from giving folks a proactive heads up on the decisions that are taking place in their communities. Um, that gives them a good bit of time to be well informed of the process and hopefully to make adequate input to a lot of the permits and decisions that we're making. Um, but when you move closer to sites like the Savannah River site, it's also an opportunity for environmental education and risk communication. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of preconceived notions of what takes place on a facility such as the Savannah River site. And there's a lot of communities that are nearby, both within that calendar radius and outside of that calendar radius that have questions. So I think I've heard that mentioned a few times. So as I wrap up, I just wanna offer our resources and our staff as technical assistance to your endeavors. And once again, keeping it extremely brief, it's definitely a pleasure to be with you here today. And I'm happy to take any questions at the end. Um, but I also wanna introduce my counterpart, Karen Sprayberry, and she's gonna talk a little bit about her affiliation at the national level and how she's kind of a can do it for the state of South Carolina. Talking to okay. Hey, I'm Karen Sprayberry. Um, again, I am a senior advisor on environmental justice for the agency. I retired, um, and so they asked me to come back on a part-time basis um, because of the years of experience I had and expertise on community involvement and public participation in environmental justice. I was, had the pleasure of working with Mr. Hilton back in Graniteville after the train derailment, and I worked with Delisa a lot on issues around SRS. And so um, I recently was appointed to the National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. It's a national committee, and it's kind of structured like yours, I think, in that we have all groups of stakeholders. We have academia. We have, uh, I represent the state agencies. Uh, we have businesses. We have um, environmental justice um, groups on it. We have other organizations that are affiliated with a part of it that sit on there. And our job is to um, provide advice and recommendations to the um, administrator um, Wheeler, who is the administrator for the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And so um, I just wanted to make you aware that I am the, was actually as the first representative that South Carolina has ever had that has been, a, been uh, selected to be a part of that group. And also, um, I know a lot of you know Dr. Mildred McLean, and she also sits on it. There's actually seven of us from the Southeast Region 4, EPA's Region 4, that were selected to be a part of this group. And so if you ever need any assistance or have any um, recommendations or issues or concerns that you'd like for me to take back to this um, committee, I'll be glad to do so. Thank you. All right, folks, so who has questions for DHEC? Let's start with Narendra. Narendra Malik Cab, uh, Ms. Wilson, thank you very much for a very good presentation and your staff. Uh, we enjoyed it. I have a, one question you talked about navigable, navigable waters. Is it uh, DHEC authority on that, our Corps of Engineers, or how it's regulated? It, yes, it is DHEC authority, and, and mainly we're just um, concerned about any stream or river that is navigable making sure that there's not an obstruction um, so that boaters, um, we don't want them getting hung up in any kind of obstruction across that river. Has there any been uh, environmental release from the tank farms, tanks at SRS? 
So in, and, um, in previous years, there was a, a spill. Um, it's the, the exact amount, um, the, the thought is it's maybe around 100 gallons. So, um, uh, but um, a, again, a relatively small spill. So, but, um, but, but yes, there has been that release to soil in the past. Um, there, there are groundwater plumes beneath the, the, the high level waste tank farms. And so, um, uh, uh, overall, um, uh, you know, the, it's, it's currently protected pretty well, but we're very concerned about um, any, ki any kind of um, disaster or, um, or, or big incident because um, th there could be um, a, a release or something that might even uh, jeopardize a much larger area in a catastrophic kind of event. One question, it's, I think it goes to EPA also. How does RECRA, CIRCLA, and NEPA are also uh, married together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. And NEPA is really, um, the, the site um, is, is uh, r really the, um, in charge of making sure that the NEPA requirements are addressed. Uh, you, you make an excellent point. Um, so, and they're, they're relatively separate and they just kind of go at their own um, independent um, schedules. Does it, does it require any EA or EIS to perform before uh, 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 schedule is presented for tank closures? All, all of that is covered under NEPA documents and certainly the site can ad address that, but, but yes, they, they make sure that, um, that all of those NEPA requirements um, are engaged. Thank you. Cool. Let's come over here to Doug and then Larry. Good morning, Shelley. Great mm -hmm. presentation. I would like to reiterate what Gil said. You did represent us well there in Washington. Yeah, I just have two questions and I'm just gonna ask one uh, due to uh, time constraints. Um, you said that the state and the federal, the federal government I mean, the federal side, their standards, you cannot um, go below those standards, yes, sir. but you can go higher. Yes. Now, when you do go higher and the, the client uh, has a problem with that, um, who resolves that dispute? Is it the federal government or? That would be in the state system, either with um, internal in a process with my agency or certainly the, the client can go uh, to an, an outside court, but, but it would be in the state realm. Okay, do you have a quick example of that? Um, so the, the very first example I can think of is that um, the, the high level waste tank closures, they are shared, federal, state, uh, EPA and DOE. But for example, for um, the salt waste processing facility, we chose to be more stringent and have um, a startup date of our own um, in a state document. So that's one example where we have been more stringent. Um, of course, there was no dispute uh, really or nothing in court over that. Um, but gosh, we, we are taking to court all, all, all the time. <laughs> and so, um, uh, and I'm, um, Trying to think of, um, the, to be honest, for South Carolina, we pretty much maintain uh, the standards uh, on the federal level. We, um, we're not a state that goes out beyond those federal standards very often. And so that means that there would be a, a much smaller potential for dispute um, since we pretty much stay in line with the federal requirements. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Larry. Thank you, Shelley. Um, Shelly, you mentioned that 95% um, of the legacy waste has been removed and disposed of. Is that right? Yes, sir, for transuranic. And, and then you, you mentioned that 35 million gallons of liquid high-level waste remain. What's the origin of that waste? Right, that's from uh, the H&F the canyons, from um, processing nuclear materials. Spent so fuel. Um, yes, and spent fuel. So, so everything from the canyons went to the high-level waste tank farms. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So we'll do Charles, Joyce, and then let Susan wrap it up. Charles Elton, K. 
Shelly, I understand in the presentation, eight tanks have been closed. Yes, sir. When was the actual last tank closed down? Is it last year, two years ago? And the follow-up to that is when is the next one scheduled to be closed with all of the delays that we've heard about? Mm, right. So, um, so when was the, the last one was in 2017? Yeah, I'm, I'm Jim Folk, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact date, but yeah, we, we closed mm -hmm. tank uh, 16 and tank 12 here most recently. And then uh, as we look forward into what the next tank will be, I'm projecting that'll probably be tank 15, maybe tank 10, depending on how we schedule things here, but probably tank 15, that's in the H tank farm. And that will be when? Uh, well, we completed bulk waste removal on that just recently. So again, back to my uh, gear chart I mentioned yesterday. So what we have to do is remove the rest of that heel. So we're probably talking uh, three to four years maybe as a, a rough estimate on when it would be ready. Uh, of course, just as uh, both John and, and Shelley described, we'll need to develop our closure modules to uh, get that support closure plans for the, for the detail on, on getting that approved. So I'm, I'm, I'm being a little, um I'm hedging a little bit on the next tank closure, as you can tell. But um, uh, as John mentioned, the, the federal facility agreement actually had for all of the old style tanks to be finished by 2022. And, um, and again, that, was, um, that schedule was set really back in that 2005, uh, 2006 timeframe. And back then we thought that was a pretty good schedule. Well, since then, We've had a lot of the salt waste processing facility startup delays. And as you know, that's the big facility that we need to be able to start working waste off and, and those tanks getting closed. So without that big workhorse facility, that really jeopardizes and makes closing the rest of the tanks by 2022 just, just not realistic. So, um, so we are having to reset uh, a, a schedule for the remaining tanks, which is... Um, uh, again, it's a little bit fluid because um, because we're going to reset that schedule. And um, and I've mentioned this to the the cab before, but you can expect um, right now our target is um, is around um, the summer of next year to be uh, talking a lot more with you about what that new schedule would look like. Joyce Underwood, cab. Um, I am interested about the tanks as well. Two tanks were closed in 1997. These two tanks are part of the eight that are now closed, correct? Y yes. Okay, so you had to go through all this litigation that resulted in the National Defense Authorization Act. When did they actually start closing them again after the pause? Oh, okay. Oh, um, let's see. So, so after that 2005 National Defense Authorization Act, it, it was quite a, a while, and so, um, gosh, it wasn't until, what, maybe 15 that we closed the next two tanks, and that's because, um, again, things had been stopped, and so that law was passed, and we had to figure out how to um, uh, really get enough waste processed out that we could close more tanks, and also to figure out the regulatory process, because, um, it, it, like I've mentioned, it was quite complicated, and we had to um, work to manage it all together into a process that seemed to make sense. Again, driving all those decisions into, into one, integrating and, um, and, and having one document that, that the public could fairly easily understand uh, that had all of the, um, everything packed into that one document. So it did take quite a while to get through all of that technical, the treatment, and the regulatory process is first time. So, so uh, once we did it that first time, we had a map. And so we could just follow that map, um, which is how we got um, you know, tanks three and four and five and six, uh, seven and eight closed a little bit more rapidly after that. So is it correct to assume that once you re-establish the tank closures that you were closing them at two per year until other things got in the way? It, it, it is correct that once as the salt waste processing facility is up and operational, that, that we expect um, the closure to happen at um, uh, 
at, at, at a, a reasonable rate, like what you've mentioned, um, or, or, um, or faster. Again, DOE has to really model all of that work and, and um, into the future and then propose a schedule to us. But I think your assumption is correct that it, um, once that big facility gets up and operating, um, we'll, we'll have a much more frequent tank closure at some point after. Susan, finish it up for us so that we can move. Hi, Shelley. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so back when Lindsey Graham got the law changed to allow um, waste, I think it was called waste incidental to reprocessing, weir waste, to be left here in South Carolina, was there some uh, estimate of how many curies would actually get left here in the tanks in the bottom? Of the, uh, you said a little tiny amount. Is there an estimate of the, curie, of the amount of curies that will be left? Um, right, so um, so about that same time frame, 2005, Susan, we were working on what that would look like. And so um, so it, it wasn't right then when it was passed, but shortly after we worked out uh, the overall strategy for how much would end up in the glass and how much would stay um, in South Carolina. So for example, at Saltstone, um, here's another area, uh, you know, Saltstone where the, the residuals remain from the decontaminated liquid. That's another area where we chose to be more stringent, and we actually set um, a radioactive cap on what could end up in, in saltstone. Um, uh, so, and that cap was um, 1.4 to 2.3 million curies in saltstone. Now, um, to date, DOE is coming in um, uh, lower than those numbers. So, um, so, so that, that is looking good, but that's the cap that we set for saltstone. Um, and again, that equates to l less than 1% of the original radioactivity. And so um, uh, we've also set a, a budget for the tank farms, um, and, and that budget is, um, is driven by a performance assessment. But, um, so that's sort of the overall budget, but the individual tank by tank decision is made on Technically, did they get enough waste out, first of all? And secondly, um, is it within the budget, that overall budget, that the performance assessment says science-wise um, could be okay? So, uh, so normally what happens is, is that's normally uh, what they can get out is usually better than what that budget says. So we, again, we want the technology to drive that, get as much waste as is practicable out. And, and again, the, you know, the current thought is about less than 1% of the original radioactivity would end up in the, in the tank residuals as well. Is there a, cur a Curie budget is what I'm asking? It's um, uh, all of, I mean, yes, there is. All of that's modeled out in the, in the performance assessment. And I think the tank started off at 420 million Curies. And of course there's decay, uh, you know, since, since then. But, um, but yes, that's all in the, the document. So what if we haven't gotten to all the tanks yet? We're not sure how each of them will clean up. Is mm -hmm. there a, an amount beyond which DHEC would approve being left? In other words, you've had a problematic tank where you really couldn't get out what you wanted. Is there, have you, you got a number where you say that's not acceptable, you have to keep working, or what will happen if that right. scenario arises? If there was a tank that um, went above that, that budget from the performance assessment for that tank, mm -hmm. then, then, um, then I'd, I'd, I'll tell you, we would be very concerned. I'm not sure we would make a, a decision to go ahead and allow closure or wait for some you know, other technology. Uh, usually what happens is the technology gets it cleaner than that budget allows. So that's been our experience. Um, but again, that budget number from the performance assessment, that's, that's kind of the level, um, you know, if, it, if we saw a number above that, we would say, hmm, let's, let's relook at this. this uh, we really need to take a harder look. Does that answer your question? Pretty much, okay. thank you. Bill, if you can embody haste. <laughs> Shelly, um, I know we get presentations, but is there any um, quick update on ESOP or how are we doing on ESOP? Oh, uh, very, very well on ESOP. So like I said, we've got the data from the last year out on the, the table and mm -hmm. the disk, and, um, and, and that program is going well, and we're continuing forward with it. We've got people here that, um, that do that program every day if you have specific questions, but um, it, was there anything in, I, in? 
you know, I'm always coming from a budget standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, are we okay with, I mean, are we getting the funding we need for the <coughs> ESOP? Making sure that we still get that report. Y y yes, and we actually recently re-looked at that funding, but yes, we are moving forward. Good, okay. thank you. Up next, we have the SRNL update, and this will be your first time hearing from Dr. Majidi. So, the middle one there, sir. Middle one is forward? Yes, sir. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Uh, I'm happy to be here, and uh, uh, my first uh, uh, CAD meeting, uh, and uh, I'll be happy to go over some of the slides that I have for, uh, for the laboratory. And, of course, uh, I'm sure in the previous meetings you've heard uh, from the lab before, uh, from time to time, so uh, I won't be surprised if uh, some of you guys know more about the laboratory than I do. Uh, I've been there roughly about six months, uh, and uh, uh, every day I go to work, I'm uh, amazingly impressed by the work we do in different areas, and uh, uh, every day I learn something a little bit new. So today what I've brought for you is uh, less of a general overview of the laboratory, but more of some of the key issues I want to tell you uh, of the things we are doing. So uh, the first thing is that the laboratory is predominantly located on site A uh, of the uh, Savannah River site. Realistically, we've got operations across the entire site. Uh, I've listed some of the uh, other contractors on site, um, SRR Parsons, Savannah River Nuclear Solutions, which is actually the uh, the uh, M&O contractor that oversees the laboratory as well. But we work with all the contractors on site on various uh, sort of activities. Uh, sometimes we work, for example, with Savannah River Remediations to help them with some laboratory work they need or some evaluations or some technology development. So even though a laboratory is an independent entity working on scientific and technology development, we are very well integrated within the site in totality and work with all contractors that are working on site. Within the lab, we have four pillars that we focus on. So uh, our landlord, uh, the owner of the laboratory, is the environmental program, the EM program within the Department of Energy. In fact, we are the only EM laboratories within the department complex. The Department of Energy owns 17 national laboratories. A good number of them belong to the Office of Science. A, um, a few of them belong to the uh, NNSA for the weapons program. Uh, and there is uh, one laboratory that belongs to the environmental management, and there's one laboratory that belongs to the nuclear energy. So within that uh, concept that we are an EM laboratory, uh, we have a significant amount of work on environmental stewardship. Uh, from the budget perspective, I won't go over the uh, numbers e exactly, roughly about half of our budget comes from the EM programs. Uh, that helps us develop technology, work with the contractors on site, uh, look at the remediation processes, develop new flow sheets, and develop new technologies that are gonna be both used both on site, and because we are an EM lab, across the entire complex. So we work with all of our sister laboratories that have an EM program to make sure that our technologies do get transferred there. Sometimes we have lessons learned from the other sites and we bring those and implement them on site here. The national security uh, is our growing portfolio uh, and I would uh, put it in a slightly different terms that we know as an EM laboratory and as an EM site there is a sunset associated with the totality of the work that's being done on Savannah River site. You know, we're cleaning and remediating tanks, we're cleaning the environment. At some point, that work will come uh, to fruition and it will be done. The National Laboratory on its own is a scientific and technical development institution uh, that is a part of the National Laboratory complex. So the work in the National Laboratory can continue outside the scope of EM programs. And the way we can do that is gradually over the next few years, start growing programs outside the EM program to ensure that we have a portfolio that's sustainable over the long term. So the current growth area is in national security. We have a number of different programs with uh, government agencies, 
uh, Intelligence Community, Department of Defense, uh, Fort Gordon, right next to us in Augusta, has a very expanding program in cybersecurity. We're obviously uh, collaborating with those folks as well. So that is an area that will continue to grow within the laboratory. Nuclear material management. Uh, we do that both for EM program as uh, well as uh, MMSA uh, on site. And uh, it's a program that involves looking and processing nuclear materials in general. So for example, uh, when we had an incident at uh, Fukushima, uh, the laboratory experts went to Japan and helped the, uh, the Japanese government and the uh, TEPCO to identify some of the key technologies that are currently used on site for remediations and how can we really apply those to the, uh, to the Japanese sites. Or with some of the uh, remaining material through the, through, through the EM headquarters, what are the key things we can do with our partners to help them process those materials. Secure energy and manufacturing, that's the last pillar in the laboratory. And for uh, decades, we have been involved uh, in a production site, <coughs> as a production site for the nuclear weapons program. Some of the technologies that are used from the energy perspective can directly be applied to civilian nuclear energy or civilian energy in general. So for example, on site, we've developed a new generation of batteries uh, that uh, uh, are uh, relying on uh, using aluminum hydrides, giving you a higher energy density for a longer period of time at a much lower weight density. So for a similar size battery uh, of, a, of a metal hydride battery, they operate roughly for twice as long for half as much of the weight. So those all fall within the secure energy and manufacturing. Am I going too fast? No, all right. Great. One of the areas that we have a significant investment in terms of intellectual property is an area that we actually don't own, uh, is the H Canyon. H Canyon, as you know, for many years has processed the uh, nuclear waste uh, uh, for disposition. And uh, uh, nuclear processes and ultimately resulting in waste for disposition. H Canyon, in our opinion, is a, a national asset. There are many things that can be done at H Canyon that simply cannot be done anywhere else in our country. As a consequence of that, there is a number of different areas that we feel H Canyon be instrumental in promoting the site uh, for uh, various aspects of nuclear materials. So I've just listed a few things here that results in a future compelling mission for H Canyon and a couple of the ones, the first one, uh, one area that we're trying to explore for H Canyon is a high assay, low enriched uranium. So a high assay, low enriched uranium is roughly a uranium about 19 to 20 percent in, in uranium concentration, in 235 concentration. Why is this important? Well, the next generation of power reactors uh, that are coming online or being investigated, they all require high assay, low enriched uranium. In the United States, there are no commercial vendors that produces high assay, low enriched uranium. So H Canyon could be really the only singular feed material for this precious uh, fuel that really uh, figuratively and literally fuels the next generation of research reactors that are coming online. Uh, actinide alloying and electrolytic dissolution process for Japan's uh, fast critical assembly facility we uh, got the privilege of studying the FCA and trying to identify path forward for this uh, material. And we came up with two different ways. You know, alloying is one of them. Another way is to actually use H Canyon using electro deposition, uh, the solution to get rid of the material. Again, things that come up for H Canyon. Uh, we currently are processing the Oak Ridge National Laboratory reactor fuel assemblies. Those are critical for research done at Oak Ridge. And without H Canyon being open to take that material for disposition, uh, there is really no path forward for them to continue their work. So here is something we do in Savannah River that actually facilitates high level research at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And without H Canyon, that would not be possible. So one example I brought for, uh, uh, for demonstration is that Germans have been using pebble bed reactors for research for a number of years. Uh, the origin of the fuel is actually a US fuel, but it's been converted into 
uh, and embedded into uh, uh, pebbles in form of a graphite. They're a hard material to dispose, but uh, uh, through an agreement, uh, EM program is working with German government to find a disposition pathway for these pebble bits. So one thing that we were signed up with is uh, identify a way that can dispose of this graphite-based fuel without generating too much liquid waste. Obviously, that's one of our concerns. As a consequence, for the past year or two, we've been working on doing exotic digestion techniques that actually generates very little waste, brings the material down to a level that actually can be dealt with at H Canyon, and then when we're ready to implement that process, is going to be done at H Canyon. The interesting thing about this process is that this entire process is going to be funded by German government. So that's something that we benefit by maintaining the capabilities of H Canyon, but something we don't necessarily have to pay for. So we're looking for more and more programs like this that we can implement the process without having the burden of the operation totally on the Department of Energy. Two other examples that I brought here to talk about. One is we're using technology developed and methodology developed at the laboratory to improve the processes within the H Canyon. So one thing we've done is that we kicked off the process called COIN, which is a collaborative innovation. You get smart people from all different walks of life, technical, scientific, and operational, and you bring them in a room and you challenge them with, how do I make this process faster? Well, looking at H Canyon, one thing we noticed is that there is many of the liquid processing pro uh, activities that requires analytical determination of the material. The material has to go physically to a laboratory, and a laboratory has to then analyze that and come back with a result before you can go on to the next step. So what we were able to do is that to implement real-time instrumentation in the line <coughs> for H Canyon, so as the material goes through the line without having to sample the material and do it at the laboratory, that instrument can instantaneously tell you what the process conditions are and if you should go forward to the next step or not. Using that type of capability, we're actually able to increase the throughput and process within the H Canyon roughly by about 50%. Of course, there's a, number of, uh, um, uh, there's a number of recommendations from coin process, and this type of throughput is not fully understood till you operate the H Canyon at its full capacity. Today, we're not operating the H Canyon at its full capacity, but as the future programs are on the line, and EM's decision is also on the line to see what we're going to do and how long we're going to deal with H Canyon, all of these things are things that can facilitate H Canyon further in the future. From a, from a national security and energy point, again, the program is expanding in terms of uh, cyber physical threats. A number of different laboratories, almost all of them, have some element of cyber security embedded into their research and development program. We looked at the uh, overall portfolio of all national laboratories, and the one gap we identified that we could be instrumental is the Internet of Things. You know, every day, today we have different instruments and different things all around the household as well as the energy grid structure that they all use internet for communications. And some are legacy material that have been around for several decades. We're not meant or we're not designed for internet security in mind. We're trying to identify key ways to secure those using special protocols uh, developed at the laboratory. So we have a significant investment working, again, with for Fort Gordon on the Internet of Things and securing the grid infrastructure. A little bit different than the work that's being done at Idaho and Sandia, because we're not interested in duplicating their effort, but to complement the effort in the nationwide program. We're also investing in advanced manufacturing. And the concept of advanced manufacturing sometimes gets mixed up with the concept, concept of 3D printing. Well, 3D printings are, in fact, the next generation of manufacturing. The challenge with many of those 3D printing is that when you print a part, uh, the quality assurance that goes with those parts uh, has to be much more rigorous because the printers are still maturing and as you print material either in plastic or in metal, you can print in both media, 
the process qualifications becomes uh, really challenging. We are developing process qualifications online, so as the materials are printed, they're also validated that meets certain requirements and qualification for the process you're interested in. So I've shown two different examples of 3D printing. One is in plastic, the other one is in metal. So the one in plastic is something that you can definitely go to uh, an injection molding company and ask them to print this uh, injection molded plastic part for you. The problem is, to set up the molding and to be able to print this thing for you or to, to actually manufacture it, you need to be ordering millions of these devices. Our customers was Department of Homeland Security and they only had an interest roughly about five to 600 of these parts. So injection molding was not really an effective way of doing it. You can machine each part, but if you machine each part, they cost several thousand dollars per part. So we were able to print roughly about 500 of those for Department of Homeland Security for a rough cost of about five, uh, 50 to $60 per part. So significant cost saving on a government part. On this part, uh, this is a metal, original metal part uh, that goes in a process, and this process is weight sensitive, but the metal has to be rigid and still be fully functional when you install it. So using new computer, uh, aided design and, uh, simulating and model, um, uh, modeling and simulation, we were able to come up with this design that can't be manufactured unless you do a 3D printing with a metal. So this is a 3D printed metal part with appropriate weight and rigidity requirement that now is in a particular process at site that we're using. This last slide kind of helps me to re remind me that uh, day in and day out, we do things that appear in the headlines of papers, but necessarily the Savannah River National Laboratory or Savannah River site is not implicitly uh, given in the title. So uh, I thought I'll bring some of those articles to share with you and tell you what the lab did uh, that was really critical. So uh, I'll start with this end. Uh, most recently, uh, White House published a uh, nuclear posture review that's president's document that defines how the nuclear workforce is going to be structured over the next few years. And some of the key elements of that nuclear posture review was, uh, was, was developed and ultimately promulgated by some of the laboratory employees who were a part of the working group. Uh, DOE lab unveils game-changing storage technology for solar thermal. Again, some of the current technologies we have in the lab involves storage of the energy, thermal energy specifically. We were able to commercialize this material that soaks up heat, keeps it for a long time, and then delivers it at a later time. So if you're interested in converting solar energy into electricity, you need that mediator that keeps the solar energy, converts it to heat, stores it, and delivers it at your need. This material is being commercialized through a uh, cooperative research agreement. Caribbean region becomes free of highly enriched uranium. That's one of the things we do with an NNSA and a 20 programs that we go around the world when we gave various countries highly enriched uranium or nuclear materials as a part of the Atoms for Peace program. Since 2000s, we've been trying to collect that material and replace them either with a low enriched material or just take the material in totality. And Savannah River is incredibly active and very, very effective in this area, and the laboratory is a key element. Fukushima, I mentioned that earlier, that we work significantly with both with TEPCO and the Japanese government, trying to help them identify key issues, how to resolve the Fukushima spill. Some of the labs, some of the other laboratories do the same thing. PNNL is our good partners. And lastly, how the wrong cat litter took down a nuclear waste repository. It talks about the WIP and the accident that they had, some of the experts that were on site for months analyzing and helping with the program were Savannah River National Laboratory employees. So with that, I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions. Thank you for your time. I know you've got some. Let's start sure. with Larry over here. Thank you, very good uh, program there. Um, I want to know a little more about the uh, German fuel spheres. Sure. Surprise, surprise. Um, 
the spheres that you're using in the lab now to experiment with, I assume they came from Germany? They are, yes. Can you tell me how many of these spheres you have and when they were brought here? Sure, so the, the spheres we have are, they don't have fuel elements in them. They're just the, they're just the uh, 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 practice fuel elements. Uh, they were brought here, I believe, a couple of years ago. Uh, we don't have a tremendous number of them. You know, again, I know it's just a, it's a, it's a laboratory scale. The, the entirety of the material still resides in, um, in the custody of German uh, government. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to make sure that I'm answering your questions right. So am I getting the right elements for you? Y yes, I guess what I'm asking is, so these are not actually spent nuclear fuel. They are not. These, no. are, these are spheres that were never irradiated. That don't have a, yeah. yeah, OK. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, Dr. Judy, thank yes. you very much. I appreciate um, your presentation. Um, I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, how valuable is the research reactor fuel that you were talking about that would come out of H Canyon? So this is one of those items that we can't really put price on it, right? Because uh, there are two places you can buy high assay, low enriched uranium, uh, Russia, and Ger uh, Russia and China. Those are the two producers of the material. In United States, uh, we produce uh, low enriched uranium at the commercial sites, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, the material concentration never goes above the low value that that's allotted by NRC. So there is really no uh, no NRC enrichment facility in the country that allows you to go at 19.75 percent. So it's either doing it this way or purchasing the fuel from Russia and China. Well, one of the things the CAV has taken a uh, position on is the value of H Canyon. We, sure. And so it, there, we understand H Canyon's old, it hasn't been updated. Sure. And so I'm just wondering, is is that a pot, I mean, and I know it's putting it out there, is it a pot potential way to help upgrade it by it, offsetting it, the cost? It, it is a, I'm not necessarily sure if it's a direct offset, uh, to be frank. It is a, um, it's a, it's a way to, bring a compelling mission to the H Canyon. What, what do we need from a national perspective? I know the Department of Energy is actually looking for compelling missions and compelling reasons for H Canyon. So we're trying to help identify key things we can bring in there. And you know, the German fuel, we're talking about substantial investment from German government. So that, that, that's, that's certainly one way to look at it. We're still negotiating on a price. The Department of Energy is still negotiating with a price what the value proposition is. Same thing with a high assay, low and rich. You know, my uh, perspective on any of the, when you talk about the first of a kind, they're always priceless because there's nobody else that's producing them. Now, if, there's, if there was a significant production market out there besides the foreign countries, then, you know, there's a significant value proposition we got to talk about. Okay. Um, also, it's in my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Oak Ridge National Lab just uh, built a supercomputer? Well, they're the, they're the, they're the, they use supercomputers. Uh, supercomputers are typically built by vendors. Okay, well, I mean, but they have one. Oh, they got many, that's right, they got many of them. Okay, and they're in the DOE's funding one for Los Alamos as well? Yeah, uh, you know, b big science laboratories, they all have supercomputers of some sort, and obviously the weapons complex, Livermore, Sandia, and Los Alamos always are in the line to get big computers, and then you have Argonne, Oak Ridge, PNNL that are also in line to get big super, super but computers. But it's not something we need. Well, you know, it's uh, something that we actually have access to those computers. So just Good. because they have it, it doesn't mean that we are not a party to those uh, 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 to those facilities. Many of them are run under a user agreement, and as a national laboratory, we get preference over some of their other users. So if we do have some significant program that we want to develop on supercomputers, we work with them. So one of the things I didn't mention, and I don't want to go too much over, if you look at things like waste tanks, there are flow sheets that goes with waste tanks. And depending on the concentration and composition of the flow sheet, engineers take a look at that flow sheet and decide what the next process is to be done. If we are talking 20 years in the future, 
it's hard for me to envision that somebody's looking at sheets or somebody's looking at computer programs trying to decipher these things. We ought to be using things like uh, artificial intelligence to make decision processes, certainly to get us halfway there. And that's what we're actually doing with PNNL. So PNNL is interested in collaborating with Savannah River because PNNL has the computational facility as well as the technical expertise to do program to, to program into the AI language. Savannah River has ample expertise in waste treatment and waste technologies. So it's a natural marriage between the two laboratory to develop technologies like that. So is supercomputer a, a, a valuable tool? Absolutely. We don't have to own it on site though. Great. And one last question. Your predecessor spoke of um, a possible uh, partnership with USC Aiken and yeah. Applied Research Center. Mm -hmm. Do you, is there any update on that? Uh, you know, that's uh, that's a, uh, one of those uh, uh, moving goalposts that uh, keeps moving at a constant velocity ahead of us. So uh, I would say the standard answer is that the uh, the it's 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 being supported at the highest level, and you know I'm hoping to see it very very soon. So, but I really don't know the deadline on it. Thank you, sir. Sure. Joyce. Joyce Underwood, CAB. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so you said on slide three that you are doing research into combating, uh, or no, national security. National security is one of your things. Yeah. So my question is with Cyber Command around and cyber security is a huge issue. Yeah. I know that the computers are only half of the equation. Sure. So are you doing any kind of research into combating social engineering? Uh, not social engineering specifically. Again, um, what we try to do is that we're trying to take unique niche areas that we're not competing or overlapping other national laboratories specifically. What we are doing with Fort Gordon on a number of different classified fronts, and I say that because I can't talk about the details, they're interested in many aspects of the uh, engineering aspects of communication and disruption of communication. And what we're trying to do is that we're trying to come up with a ways that are not disruptable by our adversaries. So I just leave it at that generically. We're looking for robust uh, computer communications without being interfered with. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, while Gil and I were in uh, Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were able to sit down with Dr. Uh, DeBar, mm -hmm. and uh, he talked to us a little bit, and some of the information he gave us was on uh, genomics. Yep. Uh, how do you see that, or are you all utilizing that, that field, or so how do you see it? A great, it's a great area, and it's a great question. Um, there is a Savannah River uh, Ecology Laboratory on site, uh, that is uh, managed by University of Georgia. And they are working on um, uh, flower, fly, you know, uh, the flora and fauna on site. They're looking at the critters. And they are really focused on genomics and its impact, uh, as its environmental impact on, on the, on the uh, I would say, non-human residents of the site. They're doing a great work, and they've done really some, uh, what I would say, pioneering work on epigenetics, which is the effect of the environment on genetics. That's not one of the areas that our lab uh, really pursues. In fact, within the DOE complex, there's only a handful out of the 17 labs that focus on genomics, and they have the best of class. I would say, if you look at the genesis of genomics in a Department of Energy, really came from evaluation of radiation impact on DNA. And it was the predecessor to the human genome process or project that ultimately got kicked off not too long ago, which completed the entire genome process. So those laboratories that were doing the initial study of radiation on DNA effect are now the premier laboratories within the Department of Energy that still do in genomics. So it's really no room for us to catch up with them because they are very good at it. Thank you. Sure. 
Thank you, Dr. Majidi. I'm Greg Murray Cab. As I recall, y'all just came off of a safety pause. Yes. And I wonder if you could give us just a brief update and maybe talk briefly about lessons learned and those sorts of appropriate things. Absolutely. You know, uh, I'll start by uh, standing on a soapbox a little bit and say, as a director for Savannah River National Laboratory, one of the challenges I have is that the laboratory has an impeccable safety record. If you look at the uh, recordable loss of uh, work days, uh, that number for the site runs right now about 16, about 16 million hours. So you never want to be the guy that's responsible for making that record uh, day one again. Uh, so when I joined the laboratory, one of the things I noticed uh, uh, in about a couple of months I was at the lab and I looked at the historical record, I noticed that over the past six months or so from the time I joined, there was a upward trends of incidents. These are things that did not cause injury, uh, but there were uh, incidents in, a, uh, in an uh, aviation, you would call them near misses, the <coughs> things that could have been an issue but really were not a specific issue. So as we looked at those trends, and as we looked at the root cause, uh, a few things became uh, apparent. Uh, number one, we had such a fantastic safety record that safety had become almost second nature. You know, imagine getting in a car and driving every day. Uh, the first day you go into an unknown place, you're really vigilant. You're looking at all the signs, you're looking at all the streets, and you're looking at all the traffics. You drive the same road for a year straight, you know, you're amazed by the time you end up at your destination as how you got there because the rest of the trip is a blur to you. So uh, to some extent, being very comfortable with the safety records that had been accomplished, I think uh, it uh, caused a little bit of uh, complac complacency within the, within the employees. The second thing was we had some serious issue with a procedural uh, that these are not the procedures that we uh, implemented all the time, from time to time, but as we implemented them, we noticed that there was error in there, so some of them needed to be corrected. And the last one was we needed more of a senior management engagement. My colleagues, when I again joined the laboratory, uh, they certainly were uh, vigilant about the work within their site and within their uh, division, but I wanted to have a more integrated team approach. So uh, we had a pause. Uh, uh, two things to remember. Number one, the work of the critical national security was never stopped at the laboratory. We had a mitigation plan in place so that the work that were critical for national security, those continued on. Other work, we work methodically, division by division, and we brought them up, uh, and uh, we are outside the standard mitigation plan, and we're into uh, normal operation as of, a, uh, I would say, a couple of months ago. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're done and clear and we're washing our hand. So what we do is that quarterly, and my, me personally, on a, on, a, on a weekly basis, I look at the incidents report and trying to identify if there are additional trends that are happening. And there are still additional trends that are happening that are not of that type of significant concerns, but there are additional trends that are happening that are of concerns that I'm you know, st st still looking at what are the next things we can do? I think one of the areas that we got to focus on is a little bit of a better and more um, targeted training. So uh, those are some of the things we're still got in the uh, in the in our back pocket that we got to execute that we haven't quite done yet. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, Tom French Cab. I have a, a perception question for you. Sure. The lab has emerged over the past three to five years, more and more visibility, yes. more and more independence. Do you see that continuing into the future? Absolutely. You know, one of the great uh, uh, secrets of South Carolina uh, is as you drive away from Aiken, less and less people know about the laboratory. And our goal is uh, to make sure that the lab becomes a prominent national player, uh, not only in the environmental management, but in the national security, as well as uh, pioneering science type of work. Uh, we are expanding our collaboration with regional universities. We are expanding the pipeline from those schools. 
and we want to again just uh, focus beyond the next 20 or 30 years and how do we leave a laboratory that is really the best in class to the next generation of people that come and work at the site. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, folks, before we take off for lunch, I want you to take a look around the table. I am counting 17 board members, and I know that three of you are talking about leave, maybe needing to leave early today. If there's more than that, I might be mistaken. So that's going to put us dangerously close to being below quorum. So here's what I'd like to do. Pull out your agenda. You see the public comment and the voting at the bottom? Let's put that just before the afternoon break. That way, if something happens and we drop below quorum later in the day, we can continue with our presentations, but we don't have to worry about our voting being compromised. Sound fair to everyone? Okay, thank you. If you can avoid leaving this afternoon at all, that would be even better. <laughs> so with that, are there any other last follow-up questions that anybody needs to ask and get out of the way from around the table before we head out? Dan. Yeah, I had a cross um, agency and part, partly piecing together the two presentations this morning uh, with regards to EPA and DHEC, along with yesterday's salt waste processing facility. Um, we, we covered some of the timing. so. Particularly, Shelly, you answered that question that I kind of had lingering. Um, so I realize everything will be retimed next year as we see uh, SWPF come online and see what that can look uh, in a favorable sense. Um, one thing that struck me, and maybe uh, both agencies and DOE would like to comment, um, you brought up, uh, John, you brought up, you know, when Valley of the Drums looked to be closed, they found five or 6,000 more drums. So to me, I would just like to have a gut check from the agencies. Do we feel that we have discovered everything at SRS? Is there more surprises down the road that uh, we as the public should be concerned with? Uh, maybe that's not the best example <laughs> of because it's not a federal facility. So yeah, we have a lot more confidence, Department of Energy, at all three of our sites. You know, we may not always agree on everything, but we're very confident in uh, at least knowing all unknowns that maybe we didn't know 20 years ago, but we have good confidence that now and complete confidence they're able to. Now again, that may be priorities of how we get to some of those actions, but as far as you know, unknown contaminants or unknown like a sh amount of contamination, no, we don't have that okay, issues. And again, with the tanks, we always have the issues with every tank case by case. Yeah. Some. The ticker may work great, some that may not work at all, so. Yeah, my concern was uh, obviously we've identified, and actually I did have that in my notes that I wanted to say that. The things that we have identified, clearly DOE and the agencies are doing an excellent job of, of getting those cleaned up, and we got a lot of his history showing that. Uh, it's what we don't know that kind of scares me. It's a huge site. Um, how thoroughly has it been searched and surveyed to understand if the back 40 has another uh, pile of drums to be concerned with. Um, so I think John put it very well. Um, of course, you never say never, but I, <clears throat> I would be very surprised if there were something out there that we have not, that we don't know about. Probably what concerns me is, uh, again, what we've all acknowledged we don't regulate or comment on is the the nuclear materials and plutonium and those uh, um, again that's the the area of unknown and, um, and and so as those things are being managed more then you might find out more um, in going along in into the future Mike Michelet is DOE and I can I can assure you that we know where all our plutonium is in the nuclear materials business. <laughs> <laughs> that you have no, there's nothing to be concerned about there. There will be no surprises there. All right. So on that note, we're ready to take, take a break for lunch? All right. Given past histories, let's plan to be back in the building by 1215 and back in our seats at 1230 so we can start on time. All right? All right. 12.